Well, good evening. Am I on? There we go. Am I on? There we go. Well, good evening. It's uh, good to see all of you here this evening. Um, if you don't know me, my name is David Turner. I'm one of the pastors here at Valley Presbyterian Church. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this special edition of our Wednesday evening classes. Um, I think Chris Woodard is going to remind you after our classes over this evening that next Wednesday we begin uh, the regular um, Oasis classes with dinner and things like that. But, um, uh, but this evening is a special presentation that we want to kind of wet your whistle for um, the rest of uh, the rest of uh, Oasis and in the beginning of this term of Oasis. So I want to welcome you tonight. Uh, Chris had asked me um, if I wouldn't mind saying something creative about our um, <laughs> presenter this evening, and I. <laughs> Well, Jeff told me that I could make up anything, and I said, well, you know, sometimes I can come up with some pretty good material, um, but I don't have to do that. Uh, the first thing I want to share with you is that um, I have had the pleasure of knowing Jeff for probably, I don't know, a number of years. It was when I was doing the discipleship here at this church, and uh, I had found out that Jeff uh, would frequent uh, the Scottsdale area in January and that he would be available to teach some classes. And I was thrilled uh, when he began on a regular basis coming to Valley Presbyterian Church to teach. And if you've not heard uh, Jeff's teaching, um, you're in for a great treat because he is a wonderful Bible scholar. Um, so Jeff is, uh, Dr. Jeff Wyma is a Professor, I believe, of New Testament. Um, he is a Pauline scholar, which I absolutely love. And he teaches at Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Not only have I had the opportunity to hear Jeff teach, but one of the high points in my life was to go on Jeff's trip to Israel and Jordan and I had a chance to go in 2019 with a group of amazing people. Um, it was kind of a dream come true for me because I had never been to Israel um, and had never been to Jordan. And uh, my dream was to be able to go with someone that was truly a scholar, a biblical scholar. And I didn't want to just settle on anything. I wanted to go with a biblical scholar. And I was not disappointed with Dr. Wyma. I loved that. And if you've never gone um, on a trip like that, um, I really encourage you to prayerfully consider it. Um, and there's some information on the back table as well about his next trip. Um, but more than uh, him being a, a great scholar, teacher, and uh, doing an amazing uh, trip uh, to both Israel and Jordan, um, I just consider uh, Jeff is a friend. Um, he is a fellow passionate hiker as well, and I like that about him. And uh, But I truly consider him to be someone that I admire as a theologian, as a teacher, and as a friend. So without any further ado, I want to invite Jeff to come forward. Jeff. Good. <laughs> so, thank you, uh, Pastor David, for those kind words, and uh, may God forgive you for exaggerating too many things about my life, and may God forgive me for enjoying it so much. So, <laughs> it's uh, good to be at Valley Presbyterian uh, Church again. I see a lot of familiar faces, and so there have been some Wednesdays in the past that we spent time uh, together. I didn't think it was going to be possible this year because actually I have to get back to Michigan in order to lead mostly a group of students. Most of my tours are for people in the 55 to 75 year old crowd, but uh, I lead every J term, January, every other year, I should say, a J term trip to Turkey and to Greece for students. And so I was thinking, oh shoot, I can't go to Arizona this year, because normally I do that like right now, like right after the New Year's we go. And I thought, well, wait a minute, if I push that trip back, and maybe come out here a little early, you know, I can maybe squeeze in some time here for some uh, sun and uh, fun and so forth. And uh, so that's what happened. And that means I only had two Wednesdays and I didn't think that would be enough, but the, the dear kind folks here at Valley Presbyterian said, no, we'd love to have you for only two weeks. And so, uh, 
So here we are. And so I'm, again, glad uh, to be here and to see a lot of familiar faces and, and some of you may be uh, new ones. Now, there's a little bit of sadness, though, and uh, uh, Pastor Turner has already mentioned it, and that is the trip that I had planned for next spring to Israel and Jordan uh, there were like 22, 24 people from this church or from this area on that trip. And some of you put your hands up. I saw, who was, who's, oh, look at that. See, all these are all the people like, oh, it's sad, right? Because, uh, you know, um, frankly, a lot of people say to me, oh, I'd love to do a trip like that. I'd love to do a trip like that. And I smile and I say, yeah, a lot of people would, you know. But uh, it takes another thing to actually pull out that credit card and then sign up and go. And so when we, when we went through all the effort after talking and, uh, uh, Ed and Beth over there were instrumental in that, and uh, it was kind of exciting. I was like, great, we finally pulled it together, and uh, now, of course, our disappointment, you know, is small and insignificant to the carnage that's going on over there, and so that really is the bigger, con uh, bigger concern, but um, it doesn't look like there's a quick or easy solution. There never has been so far, and it doesn't look like in the near future. The IDF, right, the... Uh, uh, the Israeli army said they were ready to fight for another year, right? So who knows uh, when we'll be able to pull this together again. But I thank those of you who trusted me enough to sign up for the trip, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed, too, we, we, we aren't going to be able to do that. Now, I do have other tours. In fact, one of them on the way in is to Greece next spring, and I have other tours to other places, too. But this is really a nice tour, and uh, I encourage you uh, to at least give some consideration. It's a it's the uh, same kind of trip, 10 days basically, you know, with another day and a half on the front end, another day in the end for travel, and a three-day cruise on the Aegean. That sounds nice, doesn't it? And there's lots of biblical instruction, and as Pastor Dave, he wasn't exaggerating about that. He said, I'm a Pauline, did you use the word scholar? I don't know, but anyway, I'm a Pauline guy anyway, and, uh, and so, you know, that means in Greece, I'm in my home territory, unlike tonight. I mean, I'm not a Joannine scholar or anything like that. But uh, anyway, uh, if some of you are interested in uh, that tour to Greece, uh, check it out and uh, please email me uh, about that. Okay, enough of all the preliminaries. We should roll up our sleeves and talk about the task at hand. And I'd like to talk this week and next week about neglected letters of the New Testament. Uh, and because there are some... Uh, parts of the Bible that we don't hear much about. Preachers don't preach on it, and Christians don't often read about it. We scratch our head. We may not understand what's going on, and there's some interesting things in these neglected letters, and tonight we're looking at one of them, one of these one-chapter letters, and that is 2 John. And I trust you've got a handout that I'll refer to sometimes more, sometimes less, but I want to begin with the handout by reading the text be kind of foolish to spend a whole hour trying to explain the text without first hearing it. And so I think there's some value, and maybe you have a Bible, and you'll look at it there. Maybe you'll turn to the last page on the handout, and you'll find the text in English on 2 John. I think this is the NIV version. And so again, I'd like to begin by reading it, and then immediately after that, I'll, I'll shift into our study of this neglected part of the New Testament. And then there should be time at the end. I see microphones. If you're brave enough to come forward, uh, and there should be some time for questions and discussion at the end. So here we go. So it's a letter we're looking at. And all letters have at least three parts. They have an opening, a closing, and a body. And there is this kind of between the opening and the body, which Paul has, we call it a Thanksgiving uh, section. And in John's letters, both 2 John and 3 John, there's a, what could be called the joy expression. So I've divided it up into its four parts. That's already kind of significant. But here we go. The elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but all who know the Truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. 
And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. But whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All you need is love. Dun, 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 dun. All you need is love, love. All you really need is love. <laughs> There is, I'm afraid, because I don't consider this a healthy thing, there is a Beatles theology at work in many churches today. These are congregations that really don't care who you are or what you are excited about as long as, as long as you affirm what they think is by far the most and maybe the only thing we ought to be passionate about, and that is love. But tonight, I suggest to you that the Beatles, as much as we love them, did not get it right. All you really need is not quite love. You also need something else. And you just heard the letter, and actually, you hardly have to be awake to understand that there's something else you need beside love, because John really emphasizes it, doesn't it? And that also is truth, truth yes, good for you. And so this important truth Ha, 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 right? This important message of both love and truth comes to us tonight in the form of a letter. And not a big letter, but an itty-bitty letter. I mean, compared to Romans, compared to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I mean, 2 John qualifies maybe as a postcard. But don't let the fact that it's so short, don't let the fact that it's kind of hidden at the back of the Bible, don't let any of that cause you to miss or not hear its important message. Because we all know that what? Good things come in small packages. And a good thing comes to us tonight in the small package that we call 2 John. Now, the letter, the postcard, is written by somebody who is so well known to his readers that he doesn't even feel the need to use his name. He simply calls himself the elder. And you can see on the handout that there are lots of different options about who the elder might be, but the church, that is the Christian church for a long time, and for a lot of good reasons, have said that the elder is... Well, the John you're probably thinking about, because there are a lot of Johns in the Bible, but the John we're probably thinking about is John the disciple, John who hung out with Jesus for three or so years. And what happened to this, to this John that we're thinking about this evening? Well, after Jesus was crucified and by God's power raised, and after he spent 40 days with them on earth, he ascended into heaven and then... Well, you could say the church was supposed to take off, right? The kingdom of God was supposed to be seen in its glory, but actually um, there was opposition. 
We call it persecution. And there was so much persecution that a lot of the apostles, including John, had to kind of leave Jerusalem and Judea and the area. And so John fled. And he fled all the way to Ephesus. Ephesus, the third, maybe the fourth, but probably the third largest city in the ancient world, right? Today it's located on the western shores of uh, Turkey and Asia Minor. It, by the way, it's one of the things we're, one of the places we'll visit if you join me next May, right, on our trip to Greece. We're going to sail in a boat across the Aegean land at the nearby harbor and we'll visit a whole day or most of a day in Ephesus. But even though John fled persecution and went to Ephesus, as tradition goes, with the mother of Jesus, Mary, persecution followed John. And some of us know that while being a follower of Jesus in Ephesus in Asia Minor, he himself suffered such that he was exiled to the island of Patmos, which, by the way, we're going to visit on that tour, too. I shouldn't have said that, but anyway, we are going to do that, too. Anyway, and, uh, and, and of course, he received the revelation that we find and we call the book of Revelation. But then he also uh, was uh, ultimately uh, freed and uh, returned to Asia Minor. And so this is the elder who likely lies behind the postcard that we're reading this evening. Now, the postcard is written to somebody, too, that maybe sounds puzzling to us at first. It's written to, quote, the chosen lady and her children. Now, it may well be that this postcard is written to a woman and her kitties, right? Not her kittens, but her kiddos, you know, her sons and daughters. But again, the church for a long time, and again for a lot of good reasons, has seen in the reference to the chosen lady and her children a kind of metaphor, a symbolic reference to the church and its members. There's some good Old Testament analogies about how the people of God, right, are referred to in female ways, about being the bride or the wife or whatever the case may be. And notice how the letter ends. We also have a, a, a reference from the from the children of your chosen sisters send their greetings. And so, again, uh, the best way to understand this audience is to see it as a representative for the church, the chosen lady, and her children, its members. Now, I'm a little bit nervous when I said church because you're sitting in a church and you're thinking, I guess maybe that church is like this church. And I say, no, okay. We have to remind you that Christianity was not an officially recognized religion. It wouldn't be for quite a while. And so Christians had to meet in homes. Kind of a problem because most people didn't have homes. There were just a few haves, well-to-do, a majority of have-nots. And so wherever the gospel goes, we have to find somebody who's rich enough to have a house because we need them to allow their house to be the meeting place for the Jesus followers. And so when I think of the chosen lady and her children, I'm thinking of a house church in Ephesus or in the surrounding area, and John knows something about this particular congregation. He's worried about them, and so that's why he, by the leading of the Spirit, is motivated to send them this, we'll call it again, a postcard. Now, just because it's a short letter, just because it's a postcard, doesn't mean that John hasn't thought about not just what he says, but how he's going to say it. And so, <laughs> a simple way to think about it is, one, we have, these are little C words, just to remember. They're not on the outline. I'm just giving to you this in this oral presentation. We have a commendation. John has a kind of a thumbs up for the chosen lady and her children. But then after the commendation comes the commands, plural, because there's two of them we're going to focus in on. And then there are consequences of all of this. Consequences for the chosen lady and her children and... Da, 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 consequences for you and me, all right? So we will, by the end of the hour and before then, be talking about its implication for uh, Christians today. So we begin in thinking about the first part of the postcard. After the opening and the closing comes the commendation, where John kind of gives a thumbs up to the chosen lady and her children. It's found in verse 4, and it goes like this. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the 
truth, just to remember that's going to be a key theme in this letter, just as the Father commanded us. Now, I call this persuasion through praise. Persuasion through praise. If I would paraphrase, John, and I would say, it has given me great joy to find you tonight listening with rapt attention to everything I'm saying. Aren't your chest going out a little bit? And you're saying, the right Reverend Dr. Jeffrey A.D. Wyman just said something nice about me and us, right? Didn't I see your chest go out a minute ago, right? Now, maybe you didn't realize it, but as your chests were going up and you were feeling good about the praise or the commendation I gave you, you may not have realized that I just put some pressure on you to keep on paying rapt attention to everything that I am saying. Right? Because most of us want to live up to the praise that others give to us. And so when the elder, when John starts off by saying, it's giving me great joy to see your children walking in the truth, that puts some pressure on them to what? Keep on walking in the truth. Yeah. Now you might be already wondering, what's all this emphasis on love and truth? Is there some reason why John has gone crazy with these two words, right? No, because these are the two key ideas. And so we're going to not be surprised when we move to the next area from the commendation to the commands, plural. So now we're getting into the body of the letter from verse 5 through 11. I called it a letter. It is a letter. And we start off with what can be called the love command. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like the love command, you know, you got to say it the right way. Verses five and six, it goes like this. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Now, some of you are kind of maybe rolling your eyes and yawning. And you're saying to yourself, I'm not surprised that the first command is a... Love command because, hey, this is John after all, and we don't call him the what disciple for nothing. We call him the, don't we call him the beloved disciple? Right, okay. And you might be saying to yourself, you know, I know that it's not in Matthew. I know it's not in Mark. I know it's not in Luke, but it's in the gospel of John, you're supposed to say, where we read Jesus saying, a new commandment I give you that you See, love one another, right? And as I have loved you and so forth. And, and you might say, um, you know, I haven't really looked at 2 John. You know, I've kind of neglected 2 John, but I do remember reading something about 1 John a few times, and uh, I'm pretty sure there's some strong language in 1 John about love. I think John says things like, if you can't love your brother or sister whom you see, how in the world can you love God whom you don't see, all right? And so, you know, I'm not surprised that the first command is a... Love command because, hey, this is not any old disciple. This is the beloved disciple. Now, if you were yawning and say you already knew that already, then I might have to kind of remind you that the beloved disciple was not always a disciple of love. In fact, would you believe that John was at one time a fire and brimstone preacher? Because there is this story in the Gospels where Jesus had left Galilee in the north. He was heading south to Samaria, and Jesus was proclaiming the coming of the kingdom, and the people did not receive him very well. And it was two disciples, take a guess who, it was James and John, you're supposed to say, right, who came up to Jesus just a little too fast and a little too eager, and they said, Jesus... Do you want us to call down fire from heaven on this town? <laughs> and uh, because they were just a little too eager and a little too fast to do that, uh, Jesus gave them a nickname. The two brothers, he called them sons of? Thunder. Ah, you know that, sons of thunder, yes. But you know, even sons of thunder, when you hang out with Jesus for a while, right, you kind of realize the importance of? Love, love for God and love for others. Even sons of thunder can turn into beloved disciples that emphasize the theme of love. Now, there are a lot of different ways in which you can implement the principle of love. 
But the one that we need to talk about tonight, because it's relevant to the postcard we're looking at, has to do with hospitality. So there are lots of ways to demonstrate love, but one important way, especially for this postcard, is hospitality. So first of all, let me look just elsewhere in Scripture, just in case you doubt whether hospitality is a big deal. Paul in Romans 12, 13 says, practice hospitality. Peter, different author altogether, he says in chapter 4, verse 9, be hospitable to one another without complaint. Paul, again, when he talks about qualifications for elders, one of the qualifications is that the elder be hospitable. And then there's this interesting text that I do think most of us know about from the book of Hebrews, where it says, keep on loving one another and do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Okay, so throughout the New Testament... One of the characteristic features of Jesus' followers, right, is they are people of love. They demonstrate love, especially through the hospitality that they show to others. Now, why is that important for the postcard that we're looking at tonight? Well, think about this for a minute. You're a Jesus follower in the first century. Your religion is a new one. It's not approved by the Romans. And so, uh, I mean, it's not that you're shy about it, but, you know, you can't just meet in a public building. You can't buy a building or build a building and devote it to Christianity. No, you got to meet in people's homes. And so that means every once in a while, other Jesus followers from other places, other house churches will come to you and you got to knock on the door, right? And they might say, Jesus, or something like that. And you go, me too, right? And then normally what, normally what you do is you open the door and you would show... Hospitality, you would show love. That's what you normally would do, and that's a good thing. However, if you think about it, when you let someone into your house like that, remember you're also at the same time letting them into your church, because your church meets in your house. And although your house doesn't have a pulpit like this, what you're kind of doing is you're giving an opportunity for any one or ones to come into your house and church and to then have a platform to say things that are untrue. Catch that? Valley Presbyterian's done something dangerous. You let this guy from Calvin Seminary come into your pulpit and say, you never know. Well, hopefully we have a trust relationship now, right? But maybe you're not at the beginning. And so John knows that there are, we're going to get this in a minute. John knows that, uh, that, you know, that there are going to be some Christian leaders, people who claim to be Christians anyway, they are going to be knocking on the chosen lady and her children's home. And he knows that the chosen lady and her children will do what they normally do, what Christians ought to do, and that is to show hospitality. But the trouble is, John is so worried that this teaching, this untrue teaching is so dangerous that he'll say in the letter, you close the door. You don't let them into your house. And you go like, ouch, that's harsh. I thought Christians were into love. And we say, yes, we are into love. But sometimes the issue at hand is so serious. Sometimes there's such a concern for truth that that concern means that you actually close the door, right? Well, that's the first command. We'll get to the second one and we'll maybe hear a little bit more about people for whom we should not show hospitality and close the door. Remember, after the commendation comes the commands, plural. So the first command is a love command. You're not surprised, I hope, that the second command is a truth command. And it deals really with verses 7 through 11, but it's verse 7. Verse 7 is really the it's a hard verse, really, because to make sense of it all, but it really comes down to verse 7, so let's hear it and then spend some time thinking about it some more. So the text goes like this. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Now, I know you're paying rapt attention to everything I say, but let it not be lost on you what John actually says. He doesn't just say... These are people who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ. 
They do acknowledge Jesus Christ. That's, that's why he's so nervous about them. They claim to be followers of Jesus. That's not what he says here. He says, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. So they believe in a Jesus. They just don't believe a Jesus who's come in the flesh. You see that important difference? I see some puzzled expressions, and I'm not surprised. You probably never met somebody who says, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I just don't believe in a Jesus who's come in the flesh. Okay, it sounds maybe weird or strange. Although... Ultimately, I'd like you to see in our end of our time together that I'm afraid that their descendants are still around today and, and, and they have a way of sneaking into the church, at least these false ideas. So on the handout, which I'm not following so closely, but you see there, let's see, um, page two, you see the doctrinal error and you see that key verse, verse seven, you can also see some links to 1 John because 2 John is like the Reader's Digest version of 1 John. So actually, you're getting a bonus tonight. You should be really excited, you know, because if you get 2 John right, you can walk out of here and say, I'm really smart about 1 John too now. <laughs> so you see a word there, and the first word under point 2B is a, a word you probably don't know. It's called docetism. You see that there? Docetism, right? Page 2.2b, docetism. Why is it good to know about that word? It's a Greek verb meaning to seem or to appear like. And this is the idea that Jesus only seemed to be human. Jesus only appeared to be a man. But no, he wasn't human. He wasn't a man. He was God. Actually, humanity was like a pretty clever Halloween disguise. Jesus was God, and then he put on this costume called humanity, and, well, it fooled everybody. Everybody thought he was a regular guy, but no, he wasn't a regular guy. He was God. Jesus didn't come in the flesh, okay? He only seemed to be human. Docetism, that's a name that often is given to it. Another name that sometimes scholars use is the name Gnosticism. Do you see the name there, Gnosticism? I'll say why it's proto in a minute. Gnosticism is another Greek word meaning knowledge. And they were, we have these writings that emerged around the time, and this is the idea that, well, uh, you need special knowledge to really be saved. And part of the knowledge, there are a lot of things go into it, which we don't have time to talk about. Maybe you want to ask me about it later. But part of the knowledge is not knowing who we are. And, 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 and these are supposedly enlightened people who have special knowledge about what? We've emerged from God or the divine. And every one of us has like a divine spark within us. But the trouble is most people are unknowledgeable. Right? Most people don't know that they have this divine element in them. Most people don't know that this flesh stuff is not very valuable. In fact, it tends to get us into trouble. And because they don't know all of these things, you know, they're going to face certain destruction. Unlike us enlightened people, us Gnostics, right? See, Jesus isn't so much a savior as he is a teacher. Do you see the difference? Jesus doesn't save us from our sins or pay for our penalty. No, Jesus is the teacher who reveals to us our true identity. Anyway, there is more involved in this thing called Gnosticism, but it doesn't emerge until the second century AD. When did John live? He lived in the first century. And so some people come along and say, well, wait a minute, uh, how can it be Gnostic if you know it, it happened too early? So that's why we add the word proto-Gnosticism. It's another way of saying baby Gnosticism in its early phases, okay? I mean, the idea that these ideas, okay, maybe didn't come into full, fuller form in the, until the second century, but they reach back to the first century. And then one more text, and that is Serinthus. So now, if you turn in the handout to page... Five and six, okay? So just five. And I'm going to read a couple of things. I'm looking at my watch because I really want to spell out what the significance for today. So, so what you're going to find in here in these texts are 
two different solutions to the problem of Jesus. What's the problem of Jesus? Some people were influenced by Greek or Hellenistic philosophy and thinking, the idea that physical matter is bad. Physical matter is bad. And so is our bodies physical? That must be bad. Our souls are not physical. It must be good, all right? And so a downplaying of the flesh and upplaying of the soul and things like that. And so when they thought about Jesus, they were kind of troubled because, wait a minute, Jesus came in the flesh, but flesh is supposed to be evil and bad, but yet Jesus is also God, and that can't happen because that's like oil and water, divine and human, right, okay? And so they had two different solutions to this problem, these false way of thinking. One was the one that I mentioned to you already, and that is Jesus only seemed to be human, right? He just looked like you and me, but he wasn't. He was really only, that's one solution. Are you ready for the other solution? I'm gonna give it to you anyway, whether you're not or not. So the other solution is you separate the human Jesus from the divine savior. Okay, they're like two different figures. And so some of the early writers, some of these Gnostic or docetic early writings, they portray Jesus, who's a real human being, although he often is better morally, more uh, of a higher level than every other person. And then somewhere in his life, almost always at his baptism, the divine Jesus or the divine Savior overshadows, takes over the physical body of Jesus, like the invasion of the body snatchers, like boom. Okay. And then Jesus does all kinds of, that's why his miracles start happening, right? He does all kinds of amazing things. And then at the end of his life, he's, he's captured and he's put on the cross. But just before he suffers, because, right, the divine Jesus leaves. Did you catch that? And only the human Jesus is left to suffer. And I'm just looking at my watch. These texts talk about that, right? I mean, if you want to follow it up later, these are writings or writings about people of the first and second century where these two ideas uh, come out. And so uh, the earliest Christians were really struggling with who is Jesus? Is he God? Is he man? You know, and so forth. And one of the ideas that the early church considered heretical is that only he is divine, and therefore they downplay his humanity. And most people think, oh, almost, I, would, I would say, I would say um, good scholars of the New Testament say that verse 7 in the postcard, people who deny that Christ has come in the, that's the problem they were talking about. These are people who claim to be followers of Jesus. They believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in a fleshly Jesus. They're downplaying the humanity of Jesus, and they're only embracing the deity of Jesus. Well, the commendation, the thumbs up, the commands, the love and truth commands, I want to let's talk about the consequence in the time that we have and hopefully have a question or two. So I'm kind of, I got some text there that I wouldn't mind reading, but oh well. So if you go back to the handout on page two, there's a question, what is God saying in 2 John to the church today? So that's where I'm starting now. Again, bottom of page two, what is God saying in 2 John to the church today? And you can see there are two main points I want to make, and then I'll stop, and I hopefully will hear from you for a few moments. First is a general principle I want us to understand and hopefully embrace and walk out of here ready to pursue. And the general principle is it's not really a hard sell in terms of you agreeing to it. The hard sell is to you to implement it. That's the hard sell. So, so what is it? You can see it there. The idea that we as Christians ought to pursue both love and Truth. Wait, where did I emphasize? I didn't emphasize love. I didn't emphasize truth. I emphasized the word both, right? Because the trouble is most of us will only emphasize one of the two. We all have what I would call a default value, right? If I scratch you, if I push you, you're either going to be a love person or you're going to be a truth person. It's pretty hard for us to put both of them together, all right? Now, if you doubt that, um, well, I mean, I can just look at my own life. So 
Maybe you know me a little bit, okay? Would you think that I'm a love person or a truth person? Actually, if you didn't know the answer, I'd be proud of myself. I would be surprised. At it. But I don't think I hide it that well. What am I? I'm, a, I'm probably a truth person, right? I'm an egghead, New Testament professor, and I'm into the truth. That's right. In fact, <coughs> sometimes I'm so into the truth that when I hear untruths, I get just a little too excited. A little too animated. I've got like these orthodox antenna, like dee, 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 I hear heresy. I hear false ideas, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a temptation for me to kind of jump in there and to identify the truth as untruth, right, and to defend the truth and so forth. And the trouble is, um, all too often, I'll do that with so much conviction that um, the person I'm trying to convince will not like me very much and will certainly not like the truth that I'm trying to defend, right? Because it's all too easy to kind of do it in an unloving way, right? That people only experience the negative thing. And so, so, so someone like me has to say to myself, okay, I know that I get high grades on the true side, but I get a failing grade on the love side, so I have to compensate for my weakness. That's what I have to focus in on. And I can't do that alone. I need help. I need divine help. I need to pray for God's spirit to give me the ability to do what the rest of Scripture says. Paul says, for instance, speaking the truth in, in love, right? And, and that's what's going on over here in John. John wants love. Love is a good thing. But remember, the Beatles didn't quite get it right. All you really need is not love. You need love and truth, all right? And so, again, I've got I've to think about that. Let me give you one example. Um, I, I think I have it on the board here, on the outline. So let me try to set it up for you if I can. You know, it, you don't know the people involved, so it loses its punch. But imagine my wife's grandmother, okay? And um, I go to the hospital. Why? Because... My father-in-law, the grandmother's son, right, has just had a heart attack. So my father-in-law has a heart attack, and so I go with my wife to the emergency, and I find his mother, my wife's grandmother, crying. Now, that's not so surprising because you're saying, well, her son just had a... No wonder she's crying, but that's not why she's crying. <laughs> she's crying about something completely different. Okay, you ready? So what's she crying about? Well, let me try to explain to you. She and her husband, who, who had passed away, she and her husband were caretakers of a church like for years and years and years. And my father-in-law and his sister were raised in that church. And that church was celebrating its 50th anniversary. But the sister, a year or two, had left that church because it wasn't a true church anymore in her mind. Okay, so... The sister-in-law had left the church that she was reared in, the church of her mother and her brother, and she was in a different church. And now they were going to have the 50th year anniversary, and the sister was refusing to go. And so the grandmother is in the hospital crying, not for the reason she should be crying, and that is her son just had a heart attack. She's crying because her own daughter, right, the daughter in the church that meant so much to the mother and the husband, right, refused. She couldn't bring herself to somehow, you know, at least go to church for her mother's sake, right, just for that one 50th anniversary. Do you understand what I'm getting? There are lots of stories like that, right, where people in the name of truth, this aunt of mine, this aunt-in-law of mine, right, were thinking they're doing the right thing, but, you know, it came at the price of, of love. No balance, okay, lots of examples like that. Well, let's go to the other side. I'll stand on the other side. So let's imagine you're not like me, a truth person. Let's imagine you're a love person. Let's imagine, in fact, when I began this evening, oh, you, you, were, you were actually ready to stand up. You're looking for people to hold hands on, and you're ready to go like, oh, yeah, here we go. All we need is love, right? And, and that's a good thing, right? Because the principle of love is a good thing. But, you know, if you're a love person like my wife is, you know, um, you're... Well, you have a hard time when you hear untruths because you know it's untrue and it bothers you, but man, you know, the Bible says, you know, uh, 
I shouldn't, you know, look at the speck in my brother's eye when I got the log of my own. And plus, you know, conflict is so harsh. And, you know, it's just uncomfortable. And I don't want to be mean. And so if you're a love person, you say, no, okay, so I get high marks on the love side, but I get a failing grade on the truth side. And so I guess I have to compensate for my weakness too. I too need divine help, right? In order to, what? To find the right words and the courage to identify untruth as untruth, yes. And what's true of us as individuals is also true of us as congregations, right? Congregations need to do a kind of spiritual gut check and say, now, are we a loving church? Or are we a truth church? And really what our text is saying, and other texts of the Bible is saying, we should be both. <laughs> both a loving church. And that's hard. That's hard. Right? Okay. That's the first big general principle that I want you to leave home, uh, leave church for home tonight, that I want you to embrace. Say, wait a minute, I need to think more carefully about how I, and maybe individually in us as a community, can embrace both love and truth, right? So here's the specific teaching I want you to watch out for. Here's an untruth I want you to know and recognize as an untruth, because I think it's slipping into the church, because... Although you think you may not know someone who's denied that Christ has come in the flesh, the church has a history of downplaying what? The humanity of Jesus. Now, it's kind of ironic. You ready? Don't lose me now. Non-Christians. Non-Christians have a really hard time accepting the divinity of Jesus. Interesting, a lot of Christians, especially conservative Christians, have a hard time accepting the humanity of Jesus, right? Okay. I mean, in some circles, I don't know about here, you know, if I said Jesus is the divine Son of God, co eternal with the Father, you know, before all time, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, you might say, Amen. All the way, we don't say Amen here, but inside you're saying, Yeah, right? <laughs> but if I went and I said, You know, Jesus was like you in every way, you'd say, well, yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, and I say, you know, Jesus knew it was like to be hungry. You say, yeah, okay, that's true. Jesus knew it was like to suffer. You say, yeah, I guess so. Um, Jesus knew it was like to be tempted. Which I maybe hesitate a little bit. I mean, you know, I guess so, right? And then what if I started listing some specific temptations? Actually, you can get into trouble really fast as a preacher or a theologian when you explore the, not the divinity of Jesus, usually the, and I don't want to get in trouble fast, right, okay, but, I mean, think about this historically. Um, uh, we, we had the movie years ago, I can't remember, it was The Last Temptation of Christ. <coughs> Huge brouhaha, right, because this Hollywood movie writer was exploring the humanity of Christ. Another movie more recently, um, Mel Gibson, the, the Passion, some Christians stumbled over that movie because, man, Jesus really takes a beating. <laughs> you know, and even though they read the gospel all the time, somehow seeing the physical suffering of Jesus really kind of like made people uncomfortable or think about it. Have any of you watched The Chosen? The Chosen? Uh, it's interesting, the director has these little clips and apparently... So the chosen is a, a, a kind of depiction of Jesus and the Gospels. And uh, anyway, you can ask me about what I think about that more. But anyway, the director said that he got, he got a lot of flack for the, um, the Sermon on the Mount scene. You remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? Why? Because in the movie, in the TV show, all right, uh, Jesus is portrayed as practicing his lines. He's practicing what he's going to say on the Sermon of the now, and apparently there were some really conservative Christians who were really bothered by the fact that Jesus, the divine son of God, would have to practice his law. Okay, you see, right? Now, before you uh, say, I'm not guilty of that, why? We just had Christmas, right? And did you sing with me a few weeks ago, right? Away in a manger, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus... I sometimes say some crying he makes, and my wife goes, oh, you know. 
<laughs> Why do we sing that? Do we not believe that Jesus cried? Do we not believe that Jesus soiled his diapers? Do we not take seriously the humanity of Jesus, you see? And then sometimes we extend a downplaying of the humanity of Jesus to a downplaying of our own humanity. By that I mean they're a downplaying of the physicalness of our bodies and the physicalness of the world we live in. I mean, in many evangelical circles, for a long time, people would say winning what for Christ? Winning souls for Christ, as if somehow winning bodies is unimportant, right? Just think about that kind of language. Think about some of the old gospel hymns, since I'm singing tonight for some reason, okay? I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. Now think about that for a minute. There's a theology that downplays the inherent goodness of our bodies and the world, right? Because what it's basically saying is the world's going to hell, but praise the Lord, I'm going to fly away. That's exactly right. Actually, you know, that's actually Superman theology, not Bible theology. I don't know if you know the story of Superman, right? He's on the planet Krypton and it's about to explode. And then his parents put him on a little rocket ship and that's how they think Christians are like. This world's going to hell and it's going to explode and praise the Lord, we're going to be raptured up and we're going to escape it all. So I'm not exaggerating when I say that the heresy of docetism, right? A downplaying of the physical flesh and the physical world is a, a, a trend, you know, that we have to watch out for and identify. So let me end this way and quickly review for you what does the Bible say about our bodies and about the world? Well, first of all, at the beginning of creation, we were created to live, not to die. So death is a consequence of the fall. I read about God making things every day, and, and, and God makes something, and then he says, I did good. Every day, he makes something, and I did good. Not bad or so-called, I did good. And then we get to humans, and he said, I did really good, okay? And so, so there's the inherent goodness of creation. And God's plan of salvation is so comprehensive that he doesn't just save our souls, leaving our bodies to destruction, leaving the world to destruction. The overall message of Scripture is God saves all of us, body and soul. I have a friend, uh, a theologian friend, who has a nice little line that I can steal, and it goes like this. It's on the sheet. God didn't make junk, and he doesn't junk what he created. I know it's getting late, but did you catch that? And I think about the Old Testament talking about a new heaven and a new, and it's repeated in the New Testament, so it must really be important. I think about Paul in Romans 8 talking about the creation being like a woman in labor. Now, I'm not going to offend women by pretending to know what labor is like, okay? No, no, no. Not a stupid mistake like that, I will ever say. But my wife, I watched my wife literally go through it five times, and I can tell you every single time, she was a lot happier after the baby came out than beforehand, all right? And Paul says that's what the creation is like. Right now, the creation is like a woman in labor, right? I mean, it too is waiting for the day when Christ returns, and it will be restored to its former glory. In the New Testament, we never read about the immortality of the soul. We always read about the resurrection of the body, the end of Revelation, I see a heavenly Jerusalem, but it's coming down to earth. All right? And so the overall message of Scripture is about the inherent goodness of creation, and therefore as we think about not only the life now, but the life ahead, we need to take seriously the inherent goodness of our bodies. That's why we believe in the resurrection of the body and the inherent goodness of creation. We believe in a new heaven and a new earth. Lots more I could say, but... Um, let me end with yet another song. <laughs> they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. So I, I hope and pray that you're going to leave church tonight and, and tomorrow your coworkers, your family members, your neighbors will know that you're a Christian by your, right, by whatever tangible acts of love that you will 
you will uh, show. But I also hope you remember at that very moment that all you really need is not just love. You also need truth. And I hope that you pray for wisdom and power from the Spirit of God to know how to not just say things, you know, not just to speak the truth in love, but to live the truth in love. All right, friends, we have at least four minutes. I'm willing to go longer, but uh, please don't be shy and uh, come forward with a comment or a question in light of our discussion of the little postcard called Second John. In your uh, outline, you refer to the religious left. Oh, yes. Uh, and as an illustration of that, you talk about Fountain Street Church uh -huh. in Grand Rapids. <laughs> yes. What makes that a good example? So, yeah, sorry. It's a bit situation specific. So in Grand Rapids, where I come from, there's a rather well-known church called Fountain Street Church. Fountain Street Church. And you can Google it. And you can find it. Just go Fountain Street Church. Maybe you don't even need to ride Grand Rapids, Michigan. Anyway, if you did what I did quite a long time ago, you just look at what's happening in their church. And the last time I did it, um, that Sunday they were going to celebrate the Hindu rite of spring. And they were, you know, inviting everybody. Okay. So anyway, uh, this is a church that gets like an A plus on showing love, but... From my point of view, the scriptures would say they would get a failing grade on truth, right? So, so sorry to you. That's why I didn't use it here. But there are lots of congregations like that, okay? And, uh, and so remember, I've really tried to stress how hard it is, but how important it is that we do both, right? And uh, it's all too easy to excel in one, but not the other. And so the challenge of our text, and it's not just 2 John. I think we're going to have something similar next week in Jude, and Paul, of course, I cite here in uh, Ephesians. Uh, other parts of scriptures, too, talk about the need to put these two together. Still maybe one or two minutes before Pastor Chris comes, or Dave, and, and gives the hook. So <laughs> I'm off stage here, yeah. So. Jeff, if I could just make a comment. I, I love how you've distinguished uh, both love and truth, and I think... Uh, my experience um, in life has been that I think for the general person, love is very misunderstood. When I always ask the question, what is love, I get kind of a confused look. So I think that's kind of a problem in our culture. And I always see, uh, for many people, love is equated with um, accepting. kind of accepting everything. Yeah. And um, I've always defined love, whether it's right or not, as being working for the betterment. Of, of another person, even sacrificially, and sometimes the betterment is not always agreeing. We know that when we raise children, um, but it's working for the betterment, and the betterment, in my mind, is equated with truth as well. Good. Thank you for that. So, one more question, if you're still ready to come forward. Who is, yeah? I was just wondering about the reference to the lady and her children. Oh, yes. I've heard it asserted that that may have been code protect the church from persecution so if the letter was intercepted do you have a view about yeah. that? Um, I, I don't think so because even though Christianity was not an officially recognized religion it was often confused as a form of Judaism and so the church kind of avoided some conflict with the Roman authorities because of that but the other alternative is let's imagine you use code language I mean if someone were not happy with the Christian I mean you're, they're meeting in a home right and you're gathering you know, that's not going to be enough to kind of somehow avoid persecution, right? So I'm not so convinced that that's the motivation, you know, behind, you know, as if somehow they're trying to hide their identity from the civic uh, authorities and so forth. I mean, I'm, I'm freely, I mean, I don't think that's the best interpretation, but it could be a specific lady and her children, you know. Uh, I don't think that in any way would change or undermine the inherent, you know, the fundamental message of the, of the letter or the postcard. So, some of you know from before that my motto is, the longer I am, the better I'd better be, right? And so, uh, 
Chris is going to prevent me from being too long. Um, would it be possible, Chris, though, uh, you have to say something, but then I could close our time in prayer, yeah. and then people can go. And if you have a question, you can either ask me privately in front, and the handout somewhere has my email address, and so uh, feel free to uh, you know, email me with whatever question or concern that you have, too. But is there a quick announcement and well, a prayer, and then we can... For tonight, okay. I'm glad I left my wallet in my car, because I'd probably hand you my credit card right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> tonight to sign up for a trip, but our uh, discipleship and spiritual growth team uh, is excited for the new year. If you haven't picked up your ministry brochure, I want to encourage you to do that. It's got a full rundown of, of all the things that we're offering here at the church. So thank you all for being here and starting out. Thank you, Dr. Wyman. Good. For, uh, for being here with us as well. Oh, you're welcome. So. If, if you're able and willing, would you stand? And we'll just have our closing prayer. And then again, you can be uh, dismissed. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the Bible. We thank you for the scriptures because in it we believe that you reveal who you are and what you've done for us, especially through your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray now that the, the Holy Spirit would work in us in such a way that the words of even this little postcard will be planted in our hearts and minds in such a way that they'll bear fruit the fruit of both love and truth. And so walk with us as we leave this place and help us to be um, good examples of what it means to be your children and followers of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next week.